you all for attending. I'm Kevin Crane from Bank of America. Let me just open with a few opening comments. It's certainly an honor to be here and moderate this fantastic discussion about longevity and its intersection with the private sector. Um, from a Bank of America perspective, um, starting with our CEO to the heads of the lines of businesses, of which I'm going to introduce Andy in a minute, who is one of those, to our board of directors, uh, longevity is a central theme in terms of how the bank serves its many clients. Um, when we look at the impact of the 21st century workforce, with longevity and older workforce, um, employees wanting to take care of their parents and others, elder care to us is a major issue of impact that's coming, um, not only to Bank of America and 200,000 employees that we have, but also to our clients, which are companies and employees, and what can we do in concert with them to make elder caregiving a priority in terms of a benefit and something that employees feel comfortable in doing and their employers support them. So with that, I'm going to introduce my two very esteemed speakers. Um, Andy Sieg is the head of Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, uh, of which he has the responsibility for close to 15,000 financial advisors across the United States who service over $2 trillion of individual wealth uh, for individuals that's managed every day. Um, beyond that, in 2015, Andy represented Bank of America Merrill Lynch at the White House Conference on Aging. Um, he also represents Bank of America Merrill Lynch on this issue on various boards. The Milken Institute, the Future of Aging, he's on the board, and the Stanford University Center on Longevity. And he also has a policy background. He studied at the Kennedy School of, of Government at Harvard in public policy, and he served in George H.W. Bush's administration. And then the last thing I'd say about Andy, Andy truly at the bank has championed the longevity issue, not only within the bank, but with its clients and in partnership with Ken, who I'm about to introduce. Ken Dykewall is Chief Executive Officer of AgeWave. For the past 35 plus years, Ken literally has been America's most visionary um, thinker in terms of these issues of lifestyle, marketing, healthcare, workforce implications of the age wave. He has imparted that wisdom to over 2 million people across the world uh, through his career in various forms. Um, Ken is a psychologist, a gerontologist, a best-selling author. He's written 16 books. He has been a fellow of the World Economic Forum. He has been a feature speaker at two White House Councils on Aging, and Ken has actually been the driving force into Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, about longevity being a priority to the bank and everything we do, and we thank him and Ageway for that. So with that, I'm gonna let Andy start. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. It is, it's just a, a, a true pleasure and really an honor to be here. And I hope, uh, as Kevin said, I hope we can have some fun over the next hour. But the first thing I wanna say is, you know, for me, it's such a privilege to be part of this extraordinary meeting that's happening over these few days. Um, as I hope you'll take away from this presentation, uh, we at Bank of America and Merrill Lynch just have enormous respect for you uh, and for what your fields represent. I mean, you're truly the visionaries here who are helping us understand this new world that is emerging. And you know, from my perspective, some of what you're gonna hear today, and from me in particular, may be covering ground that you're very familiar with, but um, you know, I hope you'll take away from it that your work is affecting all sectors, not just you know, policymakers, but thinking, but really shaping how the private sector is beginning to think about the longevity revolution and, and what is in front of us. Um, so let me dive in and I'll, I'll, ask the, uh, I'll ask the question that's probably running through your head, which is why is a bald corporate executive impersonating a gerontologist um, <laughs> this morning? <laughs> and you know, the reason is very simple. Uh, you know, it's threefold. Um, number one, this is a moment of very profound change. You know, number two, we're standing, I think, at the precipice of just extraordinary possibilities and possibilities we're just beginning to understand. And number three, and this is particular to Bank of America Merrill Lynch, uh, what we're going to talk about today is very core in terms of how all financial institutions in particular uh, are changing. And so I want to start by just um, sharing with you is the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of some research that we're doing, where we're thinking about the longevity revolution really as the emergence of an entirely new economy in the world. And if you think about the age 60 plus population globally, we're heading to a place where 
you know, just this segment of our society will be a $15 trillion economy in and of itself. And at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, we're, we're covering it um, as if it was an economy that's uh, 70 or 80% the size of the U.S. We have research analysts who are, who are thinking about the longevity economy, and we're thinking very broadly around how the trends that you know, you're engaged in every day are gonna be shaping a whole host uh, of industries. And as I said earlier, you know, there is perhaps no industry that is gonna be affected by the longevity revolution more than financial services. I mean, this is at the core uh, a bull market for the kind of advice that financial institutions deliver to clients. Whether our clients are pension plans, corporations, individuals who are trying to think about providing you know, ongoing streams of income, every client segment that we serve is asking new questions of us. They're new, asking new questions of the asset management firms that we work with. And it's causing us to have to step back and really rethink what it means to be a client-centric organization, um, you know, serving uh, our clients and customers in the midst of this revolution. It's also causing us, very interestingly, to be having conversations that we never thought we'd have in the boardroom or the executive suite of companies like Bank of America. Uh, for example, if you look at this slide, I, I bet you'd be surprised that we're talking about the pasteurization of milk at a Bank of America board meeting, but we are. Because when we think about this amazing point in human history that we've reached, it's really driven by uh, developments that started a couple hundred years ago when the public health revolution uh, you know, uh, entered uh, modern society. In the 1800s, I don't have to tell you, was a period of just you know, tremendous breakthroughs in terms of what cleanliness and pasteurization and you know, clean streets and clean cities could mean in terms of the way all of us lived our lives. And with that introduction, we saw something very remarkable take place, which was the beginning of a fall in death rates uh, around the world, particularly in the West. And as we entered the 20th century, of course, you know, medical breakthroughs of all kinds, particularly you know, the introduction of antibiotics, you know, accelerated this trend in terms of declines in death rates. In the more recent decades, we've become attuned to lifestyle changes and how they can continue us on this path of progress. And we're most excited because out in front of us, we see new uh, areas of research that represent breakthroughs that we're just beginning to kind of comprehend as biotechnology, nanotechnology, information technology overall is going to help us kind of continue the paths of progress. This collective fall in death rates, and talking about death rates may not be, of course, the most uh, positive way to frame what's happening, has made the 20th century the most remarkable century in terms of what really matters, which is how much, how long a life and how happy a life can we all live. We've seen a, you know, essentially a doubling of life expectancy that's unfolded in the 20th century. And when you think about that, that's extraordinary. But when you take a few steps back, something even more extraordinary takes place because you see this change has not just been the kind of linear change that we've seen in the 20th century. Across the, the great sweep of human history, this is an exponential curve that we've now, we've now embarked upon. You know, the, the axis there at the bottom of that slide, of course, is not the normal axis that's going back 100 years or 200 years. This is saying, you know, essentially from the dawn of mankind, life expectancy was only uh, generally in the, in the mid-20s. And you know, when, you, when you think about this longevity revolution in this context, you know, it's not for once uh, hyperbole or exaggeration to say you know, we're at a moment that none of us you know, could have imagined. Essentially, no human beings walking the face of the earth have had to grapple with what we're grappling with, you're grappling with at today's meeting. It's, of course, a global phenomena, and there is a global perspective in the room when you think about the developments that are occurring and you know the redder this slide is the greater the population is that's uh, over age 65 in our economies you go from 2010 to 2050 and essentially every corner of the world with the exception of uh, parts of Africa is becoming very red uh, as the world is aging and here in the US in particular there's something else that's taking place we don't just have the longevity revolution unfolding based on the scientific and medical breakthroughs that we've experienced, we have this very remarkable cultural and social uh, accelerator 
which is the fact that this baby boom generation in the US is experiencing this longevity revolution. And you know, we all know the baby boom generation, you know, those Americans born you know, after World War II, you know, drove earlier in the century just enormous growth in the population across the lifeline. We're now seeing you know, population growth exploding in the over 65 population, 73, 54% growth rates. So what's this mean? Well, when you have the, the Woodstock generation, the generation that has redefined American life at every stage of their lives, entering you know, later life, entering what we used to think about as retirement, essentially there is no assumption that we've had about what later life is all about that will hold or that will remain intact in its traditional form. You know, think about how we have all come to, to look at retirement. You know, images like the one on the screen. Retirement has been a time of retreat, decline, a time of, you know, leisure, a time of separation. Baby boomers, throw that out the window. I mean, that is not their image of what later life should be about. They're rewriting the book, and they're writing the book now around a later life that is a time of engagement or re-engagement, a time of connecting to communities, a time of you know, leveraging health and wealth in ways that we couldn't have imagined in later life. Imagine for a minute being, you know, seeing this from the eyes of a financial institution. I mean, every pit of marketing collateral, every tone that we've taken in any of the ads that we've run over the last 50 years, we need to throw it away and rethink it. And much more fundamentally, we have to rethink what kind of advice do these clients need today? Uh, and it's not advice about how to play an extra 4,000 rounds of golf between that age you know, 85 and 95 that you weren't expecting to have. It's advice about how to become an impact investor, how to you know, lead a truly fulfilling second and third act of your career, how to wrestle with decisions about sustainable income streams in a world where pension plans don't exist in a traditional sense any longer. This is enormous and fundamental change, and I think you'll see that change cause industries and firms like ours to not only be doing new things, but to be sending messages you know, out you know, through our marketing and communications, which are very different, which I think are going to be electrifying in many ways, because they're going to redefine the mental image that we all have around what is possible in later life. You know, from our perspective, when you think about the assumptions and how fundamentally they're changing, if there's one thing we know or we thought we knew about retirement is retirement equals not working anymore. But guess what? That's not what, uh, that's not what the marketplace thinks. You know, today, when you, when you ask those who are within 15 or 20 years of retirement, what's your ideal retirement all about? 72% of Americans tell us work is gonna be a foundational part of retirement. You know, how extraordinary. But when you go deeper, I think all of us, you know, we're moved by this, but the next question that we ask ourselves is, is this really because that's an ideal retirement, or is it because folks are worried about running out of money, so they're, they've sort of reconciled themselves that they have to work um, if they're gonna make ends meet. Interestingly, across every wealth, every point in the wealth spectrum, and every point in the income spectrum, respondents to surveys like this are telling us that they intend to work not because they have to, but because they want to. And the reason they want to is because work is about you know, social connections and pride and sense of place and sense of purpose. Um, and that's far more of a motivator for this desire to be engaged in the workforce than anything about you know, making ends meet or avoiding running out of money. If we think about other institutions in our society that are being rocked by these changes, core dynamic that's driving that, I believe, is that so many Americans and people around the world are thinking about the longevity bonus in a way that is causing them to question not just how they're spending later life, they're questioning how their entire life will unfold, what that whole life course is gonna to mean to them. You know, we know the arc of our lives or our parents' lives was pretty simple. You spend the first part of your life and, you know, becoming educated, you join the workforce, you have a period of leisure that used to be traditional retirement. You separated from the workforce. And I think many of us thought originally that longevity bonus would just be a period of years that was bolted on the end of that life course. If our life expectancy went from something in the mid-50s to the high 70s and now to the mid-80s, 
we just take those extra years and put them right there at the end of our life. And uh, that's why I said we play that extra four or 5,000 rounds of golf. Well, it turns out that's not at all the case because we're now seeing that traditional life course, you know, really being redefined across generations. Americans uh, of all ages, you know, down through the millennials who are, you know, in the room today, I think are, and sometimes explicitly and sometimes intuitively understanding, they have a lot more time to sort of find their way and live their lives. And therefore, you know, the idea of doing all your education at the beginning of your life and then expecting that to last you for 70 or 80 years after you graduate from college, that's kind of out the window. You know, we're hearing, and respondents to surveys are telling us, we think education is going to be a, a lifetime activity. We think that uh, there are going to be many points in our career that we'd like to step back and have a sabbatical and enjoy leisure. You know, that period at the end of our lives, as I've already said, is not a period of separation. It's a period of continued work, maybe in a new context. And if you think about how profound this change is, I think there's no institution um, you know, that is fully prepared for these changes. And I think maybe one of the few institutions in our society that's really grappling with us are you know, institutions of higher education who are you know, beginning uh, in, in limited ways, but exciting ways, to think about what's, what's lifelong education look like? What does, you know, what does later life look like? How does a university become as relevant to a 50 or 60 year old that's finishing a distinguished career as uh, individuals are at Stanford um, as, as it is to 18 year olds coming out of school? But this impact on, on all businesses, institutions is going to be, is going to be extremely profound. The family as well, what's uh, more central to our lives than the family? The Ozzie and Harriet notion of the 1960s has been changed. Families now are mixed families. Um, you know, they're families of divorce, families of, uh, of children whose lives don't quite turn out the way that Ozzie and Harriet's kids probably were. And if you, if you think about what that change in family life means, uh, just again from the lens of a financial institution, it means that there's, there's resources and questions kind of passing around in families in very new ways. Today, you know, individuals are finding themselves a family bank, for example, that are where, where in-laws and cousins and extended families are all calling on the financial resources of, of someone who kind of emerges among that, plan, uh, that clan as the primary, you know, a primary provider or mentor. Um, and for all the changes that are taking place, I draw your eyes to the statistic on the right, still within most families and even within couples, these topics, these changes, the way money is being redefined in the context of very different family dynamics is not being discussed. It's an area of, of great you know, silence. Um, you know, when we think about the obligations that we have as advisors, one of the most fundamental obligations going forward is going to be to stimulate a conversation within families about how later life is unfolding, about how the family bank is operating, uh, and, and, and again, a, a frequently underappreciated change. Now, I talked about our great optimism around the longevity revolution. If there's a topic that is almost impossible to look at with an optimistic eye uh, today, it's the topic of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's in particular. And, you know, we as a financial institution find ourselves spending far more time and resources kind of inserting ourselves in policy discussions around topics like cognitive decline because we're not only worried about our clients in terms of their capacity to manage their financial affairs, we're worried about, you know, what the cost of cognitive decline will mean for the U.S. and global economy overall. And you know the numbers. Projecting forward, it is not at all difficult to imagine a trillion dollars or more of expenses um, that are coming from you know, the impact of cognitive decline. And when you bring it down to the level of individuals uh, and families, you know, the overhang here and just in dollar terms, what long-term care expenses will mean and what care costs will mean in later life uh, is daunting, if not insurmountable for most. Insurance markets are you know, far from well-functioning in this area of the economy, um, and the amount of resources for the average individual or average family to, uh, to, uh, to handle these costs is, it can be overwhelming. 
So to bring it all back, you know, again, to that question about what's someone who has my job doing in your meeting, um, you know, what I'm doing here is, is trying to recognize the fact that we can't do our job if we're not seeing our clients through your eyes. If we're going to be truly client-centric, we need to have the sensibility of the gerontological field and the geriatric community to understand aging and demographic change in all its dimensions. And so we're here to learn from you, we're here to have a dialogue with you, and we're here to be inspired by you. And so it's my pleasure, after that setup, which is really just a, a long-winded way of introducing the star today, uh, <laughs> please uh, join me in welcoming Ken Dykewald to the stage. So I became interested in the aging field in 1973. I was 23, and uh, I have had 67 turns around the sun. I'm feeling pretty great about that. Looking forward to a few more. Um, I've worked about half of that time in the not-for-profit sector and half of that time in the for-profit sector. Uh, we, AgeWave, and I have worked with about half of the Fortune 500. It's been quite interesting to be trying to straddle the fields of social science and gerontology and social welfare uh, with uh, food creation, and housing design, and automotive considerations. I'm going to share with you some of how this looks to me and uh, some of the ideas that I think are just waiting to be brought to life. First, uh, one of the challenges in trying to cope with considerations of aging and longevity and the consumer marketplace in countries around the world is overcoming ageism. And I, and I at least for today, would like to mention three different types of ageism. Uh, one is there's the ageism at large. You know, I haven't seen Mike for a while, my friend Mike Coden. If I were to say to Mike, hey, great to see you, looking really old today, he would probably, uh, <laughs> he'd be uncomfortable about that. Uh, why? But if I said, hey, you look really young, he might say, thank you. What is it in our world that causes us to feel that older people are less than, not as much as, younger people? My wife and I and our kids were in Kenya a few months ago, and they refer to older people as elders, but they refer to younger people as junior elders. So there's this pervasive ageism. Bob Butler, our dear friend, referred to it as gerontophobia. Uh, I would also say that there is a profound degree of ageism uh, within the aging field. This is a field that got its start and its form and its function and its flow of resources from certain avenues. And there's an overwhelming belief that older people are a certain way. And then we tell people about that. Uh, older people may not be that way anymore. Or it may only be 20% of them are whatever way you think they are. And third, there's the business community. Uh, a little while ago, we were brought into one of the major movie studios, and it was explained to us that they organize the world by quadrants. They create movie product and distribute it based on quadrants, dem demographic and social quadrants. What are the quadrants? Male, female, young, old. Okay, what is old? 25. <laughs> not making that up. Over 50, not interested. Television, if you pick up any newspaper today or on any week and look what TV shows were popular last night, you'll see a mention of, oh, the sought-after youth demographic. Now, if it said the sought-after white person demographic or the sought-after rich person demographic, we'd be outraged and offended. But we are consistently ageist and disrespectful and living on some delusion that young people, because they're making their brand preferences and will keep them the rest of their life, which everybody knows is simply not true, and everybody over the age of 50 has got no new decisions ever to be made, it's absurd. Last week, Uber made public how they're organizing their marketing and what target audiences they're serving. And if you looked at the pie chart, you would have noticed that there was nobody over 65 identified as being a meaningful consideration for Uber. Now, that's just simply ridiculous. So what are some of the facts? First of all, it turns out that the average net worth of households in America gets bolder and richer by age. Now, we often organize the world by income. Income is a non-functional metric if you're dealing with a long-lived society, because you can be 82 and have no income at all but be worth $100 million. And you can be a 27-year-old and make $50,000 a year income, but if you're paying $3,000 a month for rent, you're broke. 
But if you look at net worth as a different measure, what you see is, is that people in their 60s and 70s, not everybody you know, maybe not your mom, maybe not the people in your senior center, but as it turns out, the wealthiest segment of American and Chinese and British and German and South Korean society are older people, not younger people. In fact, younger people are broke. On top of that, if you look at the idea of we ought to target you know, millennials and youth, and our kids are in that stage of life, uh, households headed by people over 65 have 21 times the median wealth of households headed by people under 35. Now that may be very disturbing to some of you because it's part of your study or your belief to portray older people as impoverished. And there are older people who are impoverished. But generally speaking, in terms of net worth, they are soaring compared to any other time in history. Let me build the story. People over 50 are 44% of the adult population, but by 53% of all the dollars spent on airline tickets, 56% of new cars and trucks, 56% of all the expenditures on lodging and hotels, 63% of out-of-pocket health care, 67% of all prescription drugs, 71% of savings accounts, 76% of the total net worth in America. And I could show you similar numbers from all over the world. And last time there was an election, they contributed 84% of all political donations. So people over 50 are, when we, if we think of them as poor or weak or vulnerable, there are segments of them that are poor and weak and vulnerable. But overall, this is a power segment of our population currently. My experience has been in working in so many different business sectors uh, and trying to be in service to the aging of our population that the opportunities are limited only by imagination. So what I'm going to do here is to walk you through a few different territories and just throw some ideas out for my presentation. First, we do know that as people grow older, there are changes. Circulatory problems are more likely, arthritis in the joints, varicosity in the veins, uh, orthopedic impairments, and you know, I could just ruin your whole day. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is to say, okay, arthritis of the joints. Huh, that's about pain and pain medication. But it's also about housing, because if you've got sore knees or hips or ankles, you can't walk up and down steps. Dry mouth, xerostomia, you might say, well, that's just about you ought to you know, eat something moist. Well, it affects your snoring, it affects your sleeping, it affects sleep apnea, it affects your jaw. Disequilibrium. I was at a conference last week where all the tech companies were talking about being able to identify it when people were falling down through some gyroscopic technology so that as they hit the floor, that some you know, alert system could be activated. Great idea. But why don't we create like the way the kids use these Wii pads so that people could be trained so as not to fall in the first place? Third of the elderly fall each year. So if we know the body, it's no question that anything and everything having to do with health care and wellness are going to become impacted. And that could be everything from uh, physical therapy that, you know, I, I had a shoulder replacement a few years ago. And if you go to a physical therapy facility, you feel like it's Neanderthal. I mean, honestly, we're living in the 21st century, and the world of rehab and physical therapy is beanbags and ice cubes and pulleys. Stem cell technologies, breakthroughs that will allow us to stop disease. And this is a really important theme, because many of us are in business because our scientific community has not had the upthrust to be able to stop the diseases of aging. Andy mentioned Alzheimer's. 47% of our over 85 population worldwide has got Alzheimer's and related dementias. And so as we have an aging population, unless we stop this disease, there's going to be more elder care, more aging-friendly cities, more and more and more of the caring for the dementia. Why don't we stop it in the first place? I mean, just honestly, this field is not very active towards ending this disease 
We are in the business of being respectful of those who suffer. My mom died in my arms last year of Alzheimer's disease. My wife's die, died of, uh, mom died last year of dementia. I mean, everybody's families are being taken down by this disease. What else should we be doing? Our current medical diagnostic and biomarker system is absurd. It's blood pressure, it's temperature, it's you know, how you're feeling. We ought to be creating a biomarker symphony of wellness and longevity so that we could do precision medicine, precision nutrition, precision rehab, precision diagnoses. We don't yet have a modern medical system. Ours is still somewhere around 1960. What else? About half of all the doctors are about to retire. IBM Watson, or some next level of it, is needed to be able to do intelligent diagnosis. My Aunt Phyllis, who sort of helped raise me when I was growing up, is 93, and uh, about a week and a half ago, she's got terrible arthritis, she lives alone, so her doctor recommended Vicodin. So, you know, that's a pretty strong drug to give to a 93-year-old. And so my Aunt Phyllis fell down in the middle of the night, completely destroyed her pelvis, broken in every conceivable way. So it's like, you know, what kind of medicine have we got? The fact that over 90% of all the physicians in our country and many other countries around the world have not taken one elective in geriatric medicine, come on. I would also say that it's not just tech apps. It's the business community waking up to elder care and to caregiving and to what it is to be an older man or woman in this world. Here's an example. Good morning, sir. You ready to get up? Let me get your feet up. How are you doing today? Okay. Good morning. <laughs> I remember uh, always looking at my dad's arms like when I was like eight, nine, ten years old. He had arms like Popeye. He was a tugboat captain and I so admired his physique. And now it's, it's a different story, you know? And that's just the way it is. So my dad had a stroke and now he can't get around, he can't walk. And he needs me to help him out. And my son Luke and I have been doing it. And uh, I don't do anything, anything for him. I can give you a really good mohawk. <laughs> you look like a punk rocker. There's a definite role reversal that happens. I have to wake him up in the morning and uh, take care of him and groom him and shave him and shower him. It's, it's actually an honor to do that for your father because he did it for me when I was a kid. My dad's got the greatest face. His squishy face is just amazing. He's sort of thin skinned and I don't want to cut it at all. So I got to be careful with that, with that face. Like he'll just say, do this, do that. You got to make sure that you shave my neck down. You got to do my, my lips up. You know, he was really particular about his sideburns. That's where your sideburns start? Okay. I'm not going to touch your sideburns. Okay, good. Okay. How am I doing so far, Dad? Okay. You know, it takes me like a half an hour to shave my father, because I have to be so careful. Can't be without it either. Okay, I will, I will, I will, I will. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. I love that face. Hi. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm one of the lucky ones. A lot of my, a lot of my, my friends my age do not have their dads, and I still have my dad. He always says to me, he, he looks up at me after I pour love on him for the whole day, and he says, I don't know what I did to deserve you. And I say, Dad, I got you. I got you, Dad.
whole world of housing is about to be impacted by this longevity revolution. Uh, here's just a way to think about it. When we're young, we think, well, where can we live? What can we afford? Is it near school, near work? And maybe you get a partner and you share it and that's kind of works out and who knows, maybe you think you can afford something a little better or bigger, so you step up and then maybe you have a child uh, and before you know it, you're thinking about buying into a house and you raise your family there and then the kids leave home and then what? It's a really interesting question. So the folks at the Millikan Institute um, have come up with the qualities of age-friendly communities in sync with the World Health folks. People are looking for safety and security, a sense of community, uh, learning and enrichment. They want a vibrant yet affordable economy. They want to be able to work or volunteer, accessible transformation, and they've got to have access to great health care. Some of the ideas, first of all, only 2% of all the housing stock in America, and I think the numbers are similar in most of the world, are aging-friendly. What else is the case? Uh, home renovations. And the homes must be smart. I think we all need to figure out how to live together, either in the same home or in the same community or looking after each other, because the fabric of all the generations has been taken apart by the Industrial Revolution, and we need to put it back together. So while I understand uh, the evolution of senior-focused environments, I would prefer that we thought more about how do we have the young and the old and the middle age, even if it's not your own family, more coming together in our communities. And the idea of driverless cars, you know, fine. But maybe what an older person needs is a roommate. You know, maybe what we need instead of a professional caregiver or a group of people looking after each other like the village movement. Next, when we began working with uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, we began putting together lists of all the thought leaders around the world uh, in the aging field, and there were a lot of really great experts on ethics, and great experts on social welfare, and death and dying, and palliative care, and uh, like that. But we tried to see who were the experts on fun. <laughs> and there weren't any. <laughs> like, for the, you know, like, what's that about? Um, turns out that one of the biggest changes that comes as we become empty nesters and retirees in a longer life is that we have a ton of time. In the U.S. alone, there'll be two and a half trillion hours of free time to fill over the next 20 years. And we've begun to try to figure it out worldwide, and it's about 50 trillion hours of time to fill. Last year in America, the average retiree watched 49 hours of television a week. That's 2,940 minutes of TV watching a week. And that is partly because we haven't, the business community or the not-for-profit community, dreamed up all the new, wonderful, amazing things that people could do with all this time affluence. Maybe it's play, maybe it's learning, maybe it's volunteering, maybe we need apps to find new friends, maybe virtual reality and games can be brought alive for older people, and maybe people even need an orientation as to who am I now and what should I be doing with the rest of my life. I'm also a big believer that a lot of that time, or maybe even just a few hours a week, could be filled by volunteerism. Here's an example. Not all of our students have the chance to travel abroad and to interact with native speakers of English. And we're always asking ourselves, how can we make it more real, more human? tool that connects our students with seniors in the USA living in retirement homes. Hello. Hello, hello. Melissa. Hi, Dick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? How are you today? I'm good. How are you? It's the I, first uh, time that I'm talking I, with someone from another, another country. 
I'm very excited to be doing this. I look like I'm only 25, but, but I'm, I'm 88. <laughs> I live with my old brother. He has 23 years. Do you know, instead of saying he has 23 years, you could say he is 23 years old. I tried to go to Lollapalooza that we have next week, I think, in Brazil, but my mom didn't let me. Uh, you got a good mom. <laughs> good morning, dear Julia. Good morning to you. This is your dad? That's me and my wife when we were young. Oh, you were good looking when you were young. And you're still good looking. <laughs> if you could just dream and have whatever you want, what, would, what do you think you would like to be doing? I see myself in a big family, you know, with a beautiful wife. You know. and I want to thank you for this change of experience, you know. You are incredible. Abracado. You are my new granddaughter, and I love you. I love you too. And if you were here, I would give you a big hug. Oh, yeah, let's hug. Oh. Bye. Bye. Next, food and beverage. A um, couple of three things. First, uh, we know that the palate changes. Most of the food that's been designed has been designed for a 22-year-old. So when you're older, it doesn't quite taste as good or the same. We need to have older taste palate recognized in the food and beverage industry. Also, uh, the whole food industry is organized around what are called meal occasions, and they're organized around day parts. So if you're working or in school, you've got time for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so the food companies battle it out for their share of breakfast, you know, Kellogg's, General Mills, and such. And other companies battle it out for their share of lunch, and others battle it out for their share of dinner. Uh, but yet, if you hang around with retirees, you see that on average, they eat five meals a day. We have 68 million retirees in the United States alone. There's about a billion around the world. They eat a mid-afternoon snack. What food company has decided to target that? I'd like to see intelligent nutrition. As people grow older, it becomes more and more important that we have the right mix of vitamins and minerals and nutrients and hormones, yet we have no clue what we ought to be eating. You go to your local drugstore for vitamins, they're organized alphabetically. Now that's about as ridiculous as ridiculous can be. So why don't we have a bio lab in our homes as we age? It could be in the toilet like they have in Japan. So in the morning, we're given an indication of what nutrients we need more of. How do we be optimally healthy and eat foods that will make us as strong and as healthy as possible? And the whole meal program world of an aging population ought to not just be kind and available, it ought to be smart food. What else? Um, I'd love to see more intergenerational dining. You know, isolation and loneliness are a big challenge in a long-lived society where people may be elder orphans or their kids may be at work or live at a distance. So the idea that when you go to most restaurants and most eating facilities, people are eating with folks their own age or their own friends and got lots of people who are alone, can we think of a way to reimagine that? Next. Clearly, financial services is uh, quite interested in this longevity issue. Why? Because we live in a world where kind of who's going to pay for people's longer life? How do people understand? You'd be surprised to know that even a sophisticated organization like Merrill Lynch and U.S. Trust and Merrill Edge and Bank of America, when they do seminars around the country, the most popular ones are understanding Social Security and understanding Medicare. I tell you, you know, I've got a PhD, I've written 16 books. When I turned 65, I started getting all this stuff. I didn't understand it. You know, donut holes and type one and form B. And how is anybody supposed to understand how to manage their finances when it's not user friendly? Also, there's a lot of money tied up in people's homes. How do people contemplate how to create some liquidity from that asset? fastest growing segment at Airbnb are what they call modern elders because more and more older adults are finding they've got an extra bedroom where their kids used to live. Why not rent it out to a college kid? Why not rent it out to a physicist working at, at Cal or somebody visiting from, from Lisbon? 
the idea of finding ways for people to course correct their finances to go the distance. And yes, as Andy said, uh, people trying to understand what role work might play, even if it's a different job at a lesser fee, to be able to protect their principal. The studies we've done, part of the thing we've realized is that people are really hoping to have income for life. So how do we construct a financial industry that allows people to feel some sense of trust and credibility to their institutions or their government so that they feel that they're going to be okay? And last, and this may surprise you uh, or bother you, but the highest concentration of poverty in America right now is older women, particularly women over 75, single of color. The highest concentration of wealth in America today is single older women. We think that it's the guys that have all the money and they pass it to their kids. No, the guys pass away, pass it to their wives. And increasingly the wives are becoming the biggest breadwinners anyhow. So the greatest concentration of wealth in this country is single older women. At the same time as the greatest concentration of poverty. So how do we learn to think of something in a more disaggregated, targeted way? Last point I want to make, I think we need industries and connections between for-profit and not-for-profit to help elders pass who they are on to the next generations, even if it's not their own kids. I'll give as an example, uh, we did this big survey and we asked people, what is it you most want to pass on? Uh, people said, sure, financial assets, real estate, very important, uh, personal possessions of emotional value. Study at the University of Minnesota was called who gets grandma's yellow pie plate? <laughs> um, instructions and wishes to be fulfilled. My dad, before he passed away, he and my mom had been married 71 years. He was blind uh, from his diabetes. And at the end, he wanted my brother and I to listen to his instructions for how he wanted his beloved cared for and get a response and a commitment from us that we would honor them. That was important. But at the end of the day, what people say the most important thing is their story, their values. And here's the crazy game here, that unless an elder is asked by a younger, tell me what matters, tell me your story, pass it along, it's lost. You know, in Africa they say when an elder dies, it's like a library burning down. So do we have enough intelligence and enough studies and enough work to help families 10-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 40-year-olds to sit down with their mom or their dad or their grandpa and ask them some questions. Uh, Forty years ago, a younger, skinnier version of me uh, sat down with my grandmother with early stage video equipment. And here's three minutes of my grandma, Clara. All right. First of all, how old are you? Well, that I wouldn't know. How come? Because when I was born, my mother passed away, and there was no record of me. What, do you figure you're over 60? Oh, yes. Figure you're over 70? Oh, yes. Figure you're over 80? That I don't know. Around that age, I think. I was in the orphan asylum in Elizabeth. I don't know how long I was there. I stayed there quite some time, and then when I got a little older, I, whoever took me in, I boarded with them. How old were you then, when you were very little? Oh, I was a little girl, yet. In my bare feet, half the time we didn't have no shoes. We had no electric lights, we used to burn keros kerosene lamps, and uh, there was no bathtubs. And the, uh, the bathroom was about a block away from the house. You had to use a lantern to go out there at night. How did Grandpa feel about you? Well, he was in love with me. How did you know? Because he always told me. What do you mean? Well, he always told me how much he loved me and that he couldn't be without me. And he loved me very dearly. He was a very good husband and a good father. We used to sit and watch television, and when the uh, number would come up, we'd get up and dance, the two of us. 
No, you didn't. Yes, we did. We'd get up and he'd take me in his arms and we'd dance. Did you like that? Sure, I liked it. If there's a kind of message you'd like for all of us children and grandchildren to live on after, later on, 20, 50 years from now, what do, you, what do you want us to learn from you that we can continue doing? To be good, honest, respectable, and live happy with your families, like I lived happy with my husband. You're a sweetie, Clara. That's enough? For now, we got a few more things to do. Why do you think we're doing this? I don't know. You because you want to remember me, and you like me, <laughs> right? That's right. That you love me. I do love you. And I love you too. From the minute you were born, I loved you. And find a nice girl and get married, and I love you double. <laughs> Let me uh, hand it back to Kevin. We've got a few minutes to go. Uh, I would like to say in passing, though, that for my view, it's not about the private sector or the not or the not-for-profit sector. It's like we got some serious work to be done over the coming decades, and the idea that we're not going to relate to each other or collaborate or join hands just seems to me to be foolish. So for me, it's about how do we collaborate, how do we partner, how do we get this job done of helping people live long, healthy, productive lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Andy and Ken. In both your minds, what are the two or three things in, in public policy that should be discussed? This is amazing. You talked for close to an hour, both of you. There are demographic issues. There are voter demographic issues. There are economic issues. There are, um, you know, uh, social system issues. What are the two or three things that should be more talked about in Congress or the administration that's not today? It is a paradox. Um, because when you think about who votes um, in our elections, it's, it's older Americans in the U.S., and I think that's true around the world. But the, the lack of focus and the misperceptions in, in Washington, and we'll focus on Washington, are, are pretty startling. I think if you, went, if you went around in Washington and you asked what health conditions do Americans worry most about in later life, I'm pretty confident that cancer would be far and away the most common answer. We did that survey um, with Ken, and you know, Americans today, and I think the trend's only going to continue, are about three to four times more focused on Alzheimer's than they are on cancer, actually, or you know, cancer plus any of the other common conditions of later life, heart disease, stroke, and the like. You know, and then when you, and I, of course, focusing on cancer research is enormously important for the welfare of uh, American families. But then if you look at the funding for Alzheimer's research and cognitive decline and work on cognitive decline versus cancer, it's an order of magnitude opposite of what you'd expect. So, you know, that to me is, is a disconnect. And I, um, you know, I'm not sure in the current political environment exactly what levers to pull to affect almost any change, right. but that's a lever that I think in this room we should be focused on how we, how we can change. Uh, what are the major issues for me? First of all, we've got to create a healthier version of aging. Otherwise, it will, the diseases of aging will become the sinkhole of the 21st century. Uh, second, we've got to find a more useful purpose for long-live older people. Um, so I'm a big fan of things like Elder Corps, the idea of having intergenerational contributions and, and having that be more a part of our social existence. And I know there's, one, there's thousands of wonderful programs, but we've got to march that up to the next level. Uh, I am outraged that we don't insist that doctors and nurses and such um, have competencies in dealing with our moms and dads and our aging community. And they may be very well-meaning people, but they're not competent at the diseases of aging. That, to me, is unbelievable. And I can't believe that we have major lobbying aging organizations that have not kind of chained themselves to the fences until, until this gets fixed. Uh, and last, I would say that we really need to rethink a lot of our numbers. Uh, are we really turning old at 62, or is it later? 
Are we really ready to be done at 65 or is it later? And if we have more and more breakthroughs that will allow people to live even longer and longer and longer, we've got to think about the flexibility of that life design as Andy was talking about. So our job is not just to service the elders we are concerned about, but to create the vision and the programs and the collaborations and the world in which we can all live long, healthy, productive lives. So I'm very grateful for the chance to uh, have this moment. So I'm going to close. You. And I'm going to say thank you to Ken and to Andy. Thank you all of you for attending this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.